Welcome to lesson one in Six Sigma Greenbelt, the overview of Six Sigma and organizational goals. Now, after completing this lesson, we're going to be able to describe Six Sigma and organizational goals, explain lean principles within an organization, and explain design for Six Sigma. So let's look at topic one, Six Sigma and organizational goals. Now, Six Sigma is a highly disciplined process that focuses on developing and delivering near-perfect products and services consistently. It is a continuous improvement process which focuses on change empowerment, seamless training of resources, and consistent top management support. So what is a process? Well, a process is just a series of steps designed to produce a product or service as required by the customer. We use this thing called the Y function, where Y is always equal to the function of X. Now, X's are our causes. They're our inputs into the system, while our Y would be the effect of those causes or the output. Now, the F, or the function, is just the process. So as an input is placed into the process, it produces an output. Therefore, any variable or any effect the input or the process has has a direct impact or correlation to the output. Now, Six Sigma follows a process named DMAIC, and it stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. Now, in the define phase, this is where we define the problem. We create the problem statement and plan for our improvement, and then usually our Six Sigma project team is formed. In the measure phase, we collect our data from the process to determine current quality or even operational performance levels. In analyze, we study the business process to understand the root cause of our problem. In improve, we identify, prioritize, test, and finalize the improvement action plan that we have to make the process better. And then control is all about implementing improvement plans and setting up controls to monitor the system for sustainability moving forward. Now here's a list of some tools that are gonna be corresponding to our phases in which we're gonna use them. In the define phase, we're going to be using a SIPOC, VOC or voice of the customer, a CTQ tree or a critical to quality tree, QFD or quality functional deployment, an FMEA or a failure mode effect analysis, a CE matrix, or a project charter. In measure, we're going to use a gauge R&R MSA or a measurable system analysis. We'll look at run charts or control charts, and we'll look at process capability. And then finally, we'll look at an Anderson Darling test. In analyze, we'll look at an SLR as well as some Pareto charts and fishbone diagrams. We'll revisit an FMEA, as well as a multivariable chart, and some hypothesis testing. In improve, we're going to look at brainstorming, piloting. Now, there's our FMEA again. And then finally, a DOE, or design of experiments, if they're needed within your project. And then finally, control. Well, we'll look at control charts, we'll do a control plan, and then we'll do a MSA reanalysis. The big thing to take away from this is that tool of an FMEA. An FMEA is just a failure mode effect analysis or a risk analysis. We always want to make sure that we're judging and we're gauging our risk from the very beginning of our project. Because if we're not, we're not going to know how these risks are going to be able to affect us later on down the road. So we're going to talk about an FMEA in practically every phase. So how does Six Sigma work? Well, Six Sigma is successful because of a lot of these following reasons. The first is that management supports Six Sigma as a business strategy. It becomes part of our culture. It uses a DMAIC methodology for problem solving. And that DMAIC methodology is based off the scientific method. It's well-defined in terms of projects that directly impact the organization's bottom line. So we're only selecting the projects that are going to matter. It increases customer satisfaction and quality of our product or service. 
and then it requires an extensive use of statistical methods. So before we go further, let's just review some of the key terms that we're going to be using during this course. The first one is sigma. Now the sigma is just a standard deviation of the process metric. How about opportunity? Well, opportunity is every chance for a process to deliver an output that is either right or wrong as per the customer specifications. Now a defect is every result of an opportunity that does not meet that customer specification and does not fall within the upper specification or lower specification limits. So what's a specification limit? Well, those are limits that are set by the customer representing the range of variation that the customer can tolerate or accept. Then we're going to talk about this thing through, called an RTY, or Rolled Throughput Yield, which is the measure of process efficiency expressed as a percentage. One of the calculations we're going to need to know is this thing called defects per million opportunities. It's just a measure of our process performance. So Six Sigma quality means 3.4 defects in 1 million opportunities for a process with 99.99966% yield. Now in this chart, we see Sigma levels one through six. And with a Sigma level of one, we notice that our defects per million opportunities is equal to 697,672. And that gives us a rolled throughput yield of 30.2328%. So to make this a little easier to understand, let's say that our process has 1 million opportunities to make a defect. They're not units, they're opportunities. So a unit may have multiple opportunities to create a defect. Within these 1 million opportunities, we are getting it wrong or creating a defect 697,672 times, which means we're only roll throughput yield of 30%, which is 30% is good, and that would mean 70% is bad. Now, a sigma level two is a little bit better. We only have 308,537 defects out of 1 million opportunities. And so that more than doubles our yield at 69.1463%. Now, a sigma level three only produces 66,870 defects per 1 million opportunities to create them, giving us a yield of 93%. Well, now we can get even better with a sigma level of four, which now only produces 6,210 defects per 1 million opportunities and that gives us a better yield of 99.379%. Well, when we become sigma level five, now we're only creating 233 defects per million opportunities, giving us a roll throughput yield of 99.976,70%. But to be best in class, we need to be at six sigma quality, and that is only producing 3.4 defects per 1 million opportunities to create them, which gives us a rolled throughput yield of 99.99966%. Now an organization can benefit from Six Sigma by eliminating root causes of problems and defects within their processes. It also helps to create a robust product and service. It reduces process variation and waste and ensures customer satisfaction. It provides process standardization and reduces re rework by getting it right the first time. Plus, it helps us to address the key business requirements, helps us gain competitive advantages, but overall, it allows us to achieve the organizational goals. Now, taking a process to Six Sigma level ensures that quality of the product is always maintained, with the primary goal of always being to increase profit. Now, quality is technically defined as the degree of excellence of a product or service and the conformance to the customer requirement. So let's look at some of the milestones in the history of quality. The first one is Statistical Process Control, or SPC. And it started to come around uh, in the 1930s. 
and was conceived by Walter Schuert and used extensively during World War II to quickly respond and expand the United States capabilities in terms of industrial manufacturing. The next one is what we call quality circles, and they came in the 1960s. And they're self-improvement groups that are comprised of a small number of employees belonging to a single department. So this might be the HR department or uh, the operations department or manufacturing or finance. In the late 1980s, ISO 9000 made its appearance, and it was developed by the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, and this is set to really by international standards on quality management and quality assurance for organizations to implement a quality management system or program within their facility. In that same time, the United States Congress developed something called the Baldrige Award, which is just a set of criteria that is to raise awareness of quality management systems and to recognize U.S. companies that have successfully implemented uh, quality management within their facilities. In the late 1980s, benchmarking became popular. And really what benchmarking is, is just an improvement process where an organization measures its performance against the best organization in its field. It determines how those performance levels were achieved and then uses that information to impact and improve its own performance. In the 1990s, we started getting balanced scorecards, which is just a management tool that helps managers at all levels monitor multiple results within key areas. And then finally, in the late 1990s, we get re-engineering, which is just an approach which involves restructuring of an entire organization and its processes to meet customer demand. So here are six prominent quality gurus that help shape what Six Sigma and Lean is today. We begin with Edward Deming. He created the 14 key principles for management. He also helped to identify the seven or eight deadly wastes. And he created the PDCA cycle, or the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle. And he also helped in identification of system improvement methodologies. Now Walter Schuert, who we talked about previously, is the father of statistical process control. He also helped to design something called assignable cause and chance, which means he helped to identify what would be special cause variation and common cause variation. And then he also helped to create statistics for quality management. Now Joseph Uran created the quality trilogy, as well as some top management involvement methodologies. And then Dr. Ishikawa, he was the one that created the cause and effect diagram, or you might know it better as the fishbone diagram. He also helped to create a policy of company-wide quality control, and he was also the one that helped to advent quality circles. Now, Genichi Taguchi, he invented the loss function, or the loss quality function concept. He also created the signal to noise ratio and helped to design something called robust design which also helped create experimental design methods. And then finally, we have Philip Crosby, who helped to create the 14 steps to quality improvement, do it right the first time, and this whole idea of creating zero defects. The most important part in the history of Six Sigma is Motorola initiating Six Sigma for process improvements, and thereby reducing defects to negligible levels. GE also is using Six Sigma to improve their entire business system. So looking at this timeline, it begins in 1986, where Motorola's Bill Smith and Mikkel Harry start the Six Sigma initiative at Motorola. By 1995, Jack Welch initiates Six Sigma at GE to improve their entire business system. And then by 1988, Allied Signal saves over a half a billion dollars with the use of Six Sigma. By the year 2000, GE reports saving $2 billion annually with the use of Six Sigma, and that's only five years. And then finally in 2001, Motorola has saved $16 billion cumulatively with the use of Six Sigma. So in a period of what, 24 years? Motorola saves $16 billion. So a business system is defined to implement a process or a set of processes. 
It ensures that process inputs are at the right place and at the right time so that each step of the process has the required resources. So when we design a business system, it's designed to collect and analyze data to ensure continuous improvement of its processes, products, and services. And it includes processes, sub-processes or procedures, and steps within its subsets. Now, Six Sigma improves business systems by continuously removing defects within the process and sustaining those changes.